Well, hello and welcome to our final Reimagining Talent webinar of 2023. I'm Jessica Alberto, Director of Process and Implementation at People Science. I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. If at any point you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and we'll make sure to get an answer back to you. So what a year 2023 has been. If you've been following us and joining our monthly webinars, you've been in our conversations around the changes and challenges in talent acquisition. A big thank you to those that have been participating all year. It's been great to hear and learn from you. And to those that are new today, welcome. We're happy to have you here and look forward to learning your insights as well. We're really fortunate this month to have some special guest speakers with us today. As always, our webinar is presented by Christine Nicholas, founder and CEO of People Science and Hiregate, a visionary in talent acquisition industry and a widely respected thought leader in all aspects of recruiting. Christine Nicholas founded People Science in 1997 to help companies solve their toughest hiring challenges and help them reimagine how they acquire the talent they need today and tomorrow. Christine and the team at People Science have also recently launched Hiregate, a first of its kind recruiter candidate tracking software. Our next guest is Teresa Mazzaro. Teresa has been an RN for 31 years and in healthcare talent acquisition for 18. She's also a retired veteran from the U.S. Air Force Reserves, where she served for 23 years. She's currently the Director of Talent Acquisition at Catholic Medical Center and is the immediate past president of NAHCR. When she isn't sourcing or optimizing the candidate experience, Trisha is brushing up on her wine tasting skills with her mom. A WSET level two, she is a self-professed cork dork. I like that. <laughs> and next we have Wagner Denuso. Wagner is a transformational executive leader with expertise in all aspects of human capital management, leadership, and the future of work. He started his career as a licensed psychotherapist and transitioned to Fortune 500 companies, leading successful transformations in leadership and human resources, including the development of future of work capabilities. We know Wagner to be an inspiring speaker and champion of diversity and inclusion. You may have heard or seen his contributions in publications, Research organizations are speaking on the topic of future of HR, future of work, leadership and management development, as well as DNI. His soon to be released book, Leading to Succeed, is a must read for members of the new workforce, defines the key leadership skills imperative for success in tomorrow's workplace, independently from positions, roles, and titles within an organization. You can check out Wagner's book at www.wagnerdenuso.global. And we will also send out a link if you'd like to pre-order Wagner's book after today's webinar. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Christine. Thank you, Jess. And Jess, can you believe? So this year, I think Reimagine really took off, right? We, we started this webinar series before the pandemic and then during the pandemic, and we have morphed and changed immensely. Uh, I'm happy to say that we've pretty much quadrupled the size of our audience. And, and thank you for our repeat attendees. And thanks for your insight, because much of what we talk about comes from the comments and the things that you send us throughout the month that you're interested in speaking about. So, so do that. I am so excited to have Wagner here. I've been talking to Wagner since the beginning of the year. I know his book is coming out. That's great. The thing about Wagner is he, he's, from an HR perspective, such a strategist and looks at things from the bird's eye view. Teresa keeps us so in mind of what's happening in the trenches, truly a talent acquisition leader. And as a precursor to what's going live this morning, Wagner, Wagner was just talking about how talent acquisition needs to raise its game. Teresa raises her game. She knows how to work. And you'll hear me say this all the time. She works on it and in it, right? So working on it is very different than working in it. So again, we're, we're going to talk about talent as a whole, and then I'm, I'm really just to do that. You'll see the format's a little different because we're going to go over each specific area today, and then we'll talk for 10 minutes about that. Then we'll move on to the next one. We have five topics. The first topic is, so where are our metrics right now in talent acquisition um, and employee stats? So the JOLTS report came out about two weeks ago. The JOLTS report is based on October's numbers, so it always runs two months behind which makes us sweat a little bit, right? Because it doesn't necessarily give us the information that we need right away, but it is a measure that I personally like to track to see how many jobs are adding. So the JOLTS report is reflective of how many jobs we added that month. It comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In the month of October, we added just 8.7 million jobs. 
still a lot of jobs, right? But that's down from the 9.5 million in September before, the September before. Arguably the 8.7, by the way, is the lowest number that we've seen this year. I'll be interested to see what happens in November because looking now or with November's numbers, which won't come out till January, looking now at the unemployment number, we dropped from 3.9 to 3.7 in the month of November. If there's anything that I can say about these stats this year is surprise. I mean, everybody's surprised. Everyone's always surprised when these numbers come out. Oh, the predictive said, I mean, this is the first year, by the way, that I've seen ADP's numbers not correlate with the actual BLS and, and see them come out differently. And that representative, again, of the new world war. And then the third big number that we look at is employment added. So in the month of October, we had 155,000 added. Now in the month of um, the month of November, we added 100 and almost 200,000. So UE went down, employment went down, jobs are added to the workforce went up. Let's see what happens with the jobs report when that comes out again. But truly, when you look at the UE for this year, it's like this. It's totally uh, up and down, always in the threes. These indicators, by the way, are all representative and very, very closely resemble what we saw at the beginning of 2019 and what we saw in 2018, actually going through 2019. So um, does that mean that we're back to where we were before the pandemic? Is there any back? I mean, that that's something that we'll talk about in a second because I don't think there is. One more thing that I'd like to make really clear, and this is a stat that I'm seeing, and caution about metrics and stats. Uh, I don't quote them unless I feel very confident that I personally have looked at the source, right? So pretty good with the BLS. But some of the things that I'm seeing now, um, and I, I've seen four different media outlets that are saying unemployment, inflation, and the stock market, the three big indicators that we use to say, what is our economy doing are off the charts operation? The economy is, from that perspective, doing exceedingly well, even with inflation, which again, we found out yesterday has dropped, right? And I think today the Fed meets, but we're, we don't anticipate we're going to see much changes there. Yet the polls, and arguably they are political polls, especially going into a, you know, a presidential year, 23% of the population believe the country is not headed in the right direction. 40% of people think there are not enough jobs. 40% in these polls. And the, these are voters. Uh, Lisa Miser, who's a senior tech uh, recruiter that I've known for years and a leader, and she's spent her last like seven years in startups. And I was asking her for her look back this year. And she's gone ahead and reimagined her own career. Teresa, interesting. She's all, She's been in tech for many years. She's now in high level healthcare. So she, I kind of picture she's hiding it out here until she sees what happens with the tech startup world. Um, but she made a comment that I was just mentioning to Wagner, and that is that the flood of tech usage to recruit is causing greater divides in our ability to find each other. And I think it's those divides that make that 40% say there's no jobs. So with that, comments. What do you think about those comments that they're making? I, you know what? I'm happy to jump in here and say for any of you, 40% are watching out there. It's amazing to me that from every level within every position in our hospital. Now, mind you, I've got a I've got a healthcare system background, hospital recruiting. I've been in healthcare recruiting my whole life as far as a talent acquisition perspective, dabbled a little bit in the insurance, health insurance space, so health plan space, um, where there it's interesting. No matter what, in a hospital, doesn't matter what your business is. Yes, we have clinical people at the bedside, but we also have finance people. We also have IT people. We also have housekeeping. We have you know, environmental services. We have food and nutrition. So we have cooks. We have everybody that you can imagine touches a business sort of touches us, except we have so many more clinicians because we're taking care of patients. But we are not seeing that the increase in jobs has correlated to an increase in candidates. The applicant pools out there are are dry. We're talking desert dry. Um, and, and then when you have something like, a, oh, by the way, this practice is leaving and they're no longer going to provide your services because they're going to go off and do something else. And all of a sudden you're like, I need 17. Let me give you, you know, 17 to 20 
physicians, CRNAs, or you know, middle, advanced practice providers, or nurses, or CT techs. You fill in the blank for any of those professional level healthcare jobs. And then you look around at what's in the market in your region. Then you take it broader to the whole United States. Then let's take it to outside of the United States to other countries, if you can actually import talent with whatever the restrictions are with regard to visas. It, it is scary. It's scary out there. It is scary out there. When you have to cancel procedures, or if you have to, and I'm speaking in general here, if you have to cancel a procedure or prioritize a surgery based upon a need, or if you can't you know, figure out and close out your payroll. I'm making things up here, but it's just, you, you see it. Like if you can't do your job, that has a downstream effect. Think about the people that are waiting for the surgeries. Think about the people. And, and it's not just at your facility. It could be at any facility. So if you think about whatever that product is that you deliver in your organization, and if you can't deliver it because you don't have the talent, you have to dig deep and figure out, well, how do we fix this, Right. Do we do we build it? Do we grow our own? Do we buy it? Do we import it? What do we? Whose do? responsibility is that, Teresa? And <laughs> Which you part? Question to you about <laughs> who is supposed to fix this? Who is who is going to fix this? You know, I think that it's a matter of a partnership. I think talent acquisition. If you're not sitting at the table as a talent acquisition leader or your VP or CHRO who you report into, if you report into a CHRO, if they're not at the table with the C-suite having these workforce planning conversations, these honest to goodness, sit down, let's talk about the real state that we're in, then you need to demand a seat at that table. You need to talk about, you know, we can hire 50, but if you lose 60, what did we just do? Right. Right. So, yeah. Wagner, picture on this before we run out of time. Just no, just quickly. Uh, you know what I was thinking? We need to think about the context in which this is happening, because the burnout in healthcare, we we've known this for probably five years now. That burnout was growing in the healthcare industry. We know the shortage of nurses. Josh Burson just announced that in his study, right, he started talking about using AI to promote the idea that maybe we shouldn't increase the supply of nurses, but increase the capabilities of AI and other staff to do the work that sometimes nurses do. They are not up to their license. It's like um, moving up the ladder and make sure that nurses have the role that only nurses can, can do. So that is helping a little bit. But I think with the context of the last five years, some industries are hurting. Some actually are promoting the idea that they don't need talent anymore. Like looking at all the layoffs. What I'm trying to say is that collectively, what we absorb in fear is what we hear in the media. And what we hear is that everybody's laying off people. And what I hear is that especially white collar, White collar people are having a hard time finding jobs because companies are decreasing the layers, increasing AI, increasing the efficiencies was the year of efficiency. If you want to summarize 2023, four organizations was the year of efficiencies. And that does not read well for the public that's looking at this and saying there is no option. There is no access. There is no jobs. I think that's what's happening. So, you know, that that's a really good question. And we're good, I was going to talk about that in AI. In AI. And the McKenzie report that came out actually talks about, I think that's the one that shows a good graph on burnout and where employees are in a burnout situation. What we're not seeing from a talent acquisition perspective is that gap closing, though. And a lot of times when we post, especially a video talking about the JOLTS report or something, people will say, well, there's no jobs for me. Those aren't the good jobs kind of thing. That's not the case. In my experience, it's the disconnect. Going back to the statement that Teresa made, certainly a significant part of that is the sophistication of talent acquisition within that ecosystem. Understanding and, and putting genius behind talent act. And it doesn't, it's not that difficult. I mean, I, I've got to admit and unbashably plug the fact that as an RPO, we never lost for performance, and we are way ahead in our fill rates, 
even in hospital situations, in customer service, in pharma, in tech. And that's because we're compensated to do it the right way and get it done, right? So where there's a will, there, there's a way. I know, Jess, don't get mad. Keeping you on time. Okay. Our next category, and any comments, we'd love to hear. Our next category is work from home, hybrid, and, re- and remote work. Uh, and talk about squishy numbers. That is all over the place, right? <laughs> the numbers of the high, or they're becoming more and more embedded. I will say that the noise that we were hearing from the C-suite, so many saying everybody's coming back into office at the beginning of this year. And even at, you know during 2022 was we're coming back. No, we're coming back in three months. No, we're coming back in four months. Oh, another peak of COVID. Now we're going to wait another four months. I think now the rubber is really starting to, to meet the road. And in 2023, I think we saw a lot of people say, I'm staking my claim. We are going to do hybrid. We're not going to do a lot of remote. And this is the percentage of people that we want in-house. We also saw the rise of this new term. I love this term, Teresa, deckless or deskless worker, right? Which is knowledge workers and retail workers and service workers across the board are deskless workers that don't have that option, right? But if we take a look at at those who do, I'm seeing a lot of um, knees buckling. So a proclamation will come out. You've got to be here three days a week. You know, I was, I was actually in a, in a situation this year where I was at a client site, big building, the assistant who took me upstairs. I said to her, you know, how many days are you here? Because they had a mandate for three days a week. And she said, well, really just one. I'm like, oh, I thought you were supposed to be here three. She goes, I don't know if you notice it. <laughs> and, you know, I've been trying to get information from commercial real estate. And they're they're making proclamations like we're at 70% capacity. Yet I go to I'd like how are they even counting that metric? What does that mean? Your 70% is being paid for, or 70% are deaths are there, but people aren't there. I don't think we've seen the end of this in 2023. I think it's still a lot of movement. What do you guys think? I, you know, again, I think about <laughs> do you own the building? Do you lease the building? Are people obligated to be in the building because it's still being leased? So there's a little bit of a corporate push that, hey, if we bought it or we're leasing it, we need to make use of this. I know when I was with the health plan that I was with previously, you know, we are in the office. We were in the office one day a week. We called it a collaboration day. And we actually mandated it to be a specific day because there was nothing worse than in the beginning, you come in and what are you doing to meet with your managers? You're on a Zoom call. <laughs> and if you're supposed to be in the office interacting with each other, you need to get out of the office and go interact with each other, right? My team now works two days a week in the office. And it's kind of funny. It makes me smile. Um, talent acquisition in the healthcare space, typically, and it could be anywhere, I guess, they're not usually sitting in the hospital where their managers are. They're usually offsite. It could be six miles down the road. It could be across the street. But I always love when they're like, we need to be in the office so we could get on a Zoom call with the person six miles down the road or get in the car and have to drive or cross the street or whatever your situation is. But like my team's really awesome about, you know, if we're going to be in the office these two days a week, this is when we're going to go meet with our managers. This is when we schedule our appointments with them, have the face to face and get all of that work done. I actually try to have our meetings that we have as a collective group. And when I do my one to ones. I have them on the days that they're working remote because the in-office space is usually cube land. Now, you're trying to talk to candidates, you're trying to talk to managers, and you're in a cube space. It's noisy and it's distracting versus at home. You could talk away in your office space. We always make sure we've got everybody's got a good office set up. So, you know, it, it's it's a push-pull of we want to see you. But at the same time, it's not exactly like we're sitting across from you in the same building because more often than not, we're not, right? So it has to be meaningful. If you're going to have a collaboration, it needs to be meaningful. And at the health plan, we had everybody come in on Wednesdays. We would have our managers meetings on Wednesday so everybody could get in together. 
And I just think it's funny. I think you see people in meetings now, everybody's wearing a mask because it's tis the season of respiratory viruses. And so now everybody's a little bit more paranoid about being in a big space together. Um, but anyway, Wagner, you go ahead. <laughs> Well, my point of view, I, I've been talking to a lot of companies, a lot of clients, a lot of people that are working in corporate. I think it depends on the environment and the type of organization, too, because in global enterprise, it's not working. You cannot even pretend that it's better to be collocated because your teams are all over the world. Cross-functional teams are going to lead next year. I don't think you're going to see intact teams being the unit of value. The unit of value for an organization is finding the skills where they are and collaborating asynchronously or digitally. There's no other way around it. I think, and the other thing is, I wrote the book about for the Gen Z specifically, because Gen Z is very discerning. Don't, don't underestimate the intelligence of your employees. When you say that it's better to be collocated for collaboration, those are C-level executives who never see the people below them. Then they have to fight for relevance. And I think that's what we are seeing. People are used to the old ways. I see myself as a powerful executive by walking around and people being, you know, respectful uh, of my presence. And I think that's ending very quickly. So my idea is, can we be employee centric to the extent that doesn't interfere with our mission? Because there are some some days that you need sprints. Sprints are you will continue to, to happen. Sprints to design a new product, to accelerate the development of a new product. Teams are going to come from everywhere. So are you, are you hearing anything, Wagner, about productivity <clears throat> versus you know from in-house versus hybrid versus remote? Because I've seen some some yeah. numbers saying that the expectation is you're coming back in-house because you're more productive and revenue is yeah. great. Generated. And and to be honest, look, we can we can deny realities because these people are putting <laughs> numbers out. They are not maliciously lying. They are not lying. What they are saying is, for this type of industry, colocation is going to be good. Think about this, because things are changing very quickly. They have to develop products very quickly, and AI is interfering with that because now AI is a virtual thing. But you need to be collocated to do prototypes and MVPs and all this. So I do believe there is more productivity in person when you are accelerating growth. But for most companies, they are just keeping the doors open. That's not true because people can be much more satisfied and more productive at home when they know there is no urgency in getting together to develop a new product. We need to be discerning about this. And I think we are going to see exactly what you said. It's going to be all over the place next year, but you're going to see the companies that are going to win are the companies that are totally flexible. Adaptability and flexibility is going to be winning. Do either of you know an internal <clears throat> mechanism or a software that helps measure employee sentiment and their productivity? <laughs> I mean, outside products. outside of doing outside of doing customized like Prescani surveys or Glint surveys where you're checking in on employee satisfaction. So when we've got, for instance, like on the health plan side of things, again, it's a largely remote workforce. But one of the things that I think is on the is on the company, and it is the responsibility of the company. We can't just make assumptions or presumptions along the way. Is that if you've got somebody who's got, let's say, a customer service role, and they're going to be on the phone and on the internet all day long, they need to have a quiet workspace, and they need to have internet. And if they're making a an entry-level salary, whatever defines entry-level salary for your organization or company, you might need to subsidize their internet if you want them to have the highest bandwidth to make sure that they're not disconnected when they're talking with a member or a customer or or somebody else. It could be the banking industry, it could be well, anywhere. So many of these points that we're making are leading to this idea, right? The idea being you need to look holistically yes. Yes. At, and specifically at your organization, your value prop, <clears throat> what it means to you and how that affects your candidate market. Yeah. And when you look at those things, so for example, we collect decline reasons. You know what, Jess? We should publicize the decline reasons for declining because of 
location or hybrid or mm-hmm. let's start let's let's collectively put those together because we that can would do, be good we collect those decliners and so if you know that people are saying you know 60 percent of your people are saying or let's you know realistically 30 percent of your candidates are saying they'd rather work a hybrid model you can translate that into dollars and then you can say if we fund their internet it's going to cost us less than if we compensate them because they want to be compensated for their travel. Now, have you seen that? People that have, okay, I'm going to come in two days. You're going to compensate me for my travel. Okay. Jess is yelling at us, so we got to move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the end, I will go around and say last and final words. But, uh, okay. So you'll also see us start to talk about the four-day work week next month, next year. See where that's going to go. Okay. AI. So... Last month, I did a a presentation for HR.com about AI in the workforce. And the big, you know, always learn so much when when you prepare for these things. But one of the things that we talk about all the time is that ecosystem, how large the ecosystem is, and the percentage of jobs compared to the ecosystem. In any ecosystem, the largest group wins. So if I look at the month I think we were looking at was September, 167 million people working or on employment. So people that are available that you could either recruit from or who could apply or whatever the case. And only 9.2 million jobs. So it's like 17%. So here's the ecosystem. Here's the candidate base. Here's your jobs. And by the way, you're so microscopic, you're not on, your one job is not even on, right? Like to get a pinpoint on that ecosystem, how to have at least 100,000 jobs. So I think the misnomer when it comes to AI is that it's going to fix everything. I think it's making a lot of fixes for us, certainly for our technology right now, but you have to be smart and strategic. One of the things that HR, as many different professions tend to do, I hate to say this is like slapping lipstick on the pig. If you don't know what's wrong and you don't know the root cause and you don't know where it is, you run the risk of taking the shiny bright object plugging it in and creating more chaos. Case in point, where we are with AI and talent right now is candidates and that recruiting market, whether they're passive or internal, are saying, wow, AI can help me do my resume better. AI can even do a picture of me, a professional picture of me. And AI can circulate my resume to a mass amount of people that I don't even know where my resume is going. So I can plug this in and for $99 a month, it's going to circulate my resume to all these different positions. We got a warning about that when we were talking to Maury from Spark Hire. She said, that's gonna be an issue, right? So on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, our team posted a position for a recruiter. And by Friday, we had over 500 applicants, 500 out. How many of those do you think even know that they applied? Not many. And especially Gen Z is jumping. So my point is that's happening, right? And what are we doing? In HR, HR is saying, let me use AI to increase my diversity base. Let me use it to um, better assess my incoming candidates and see if it's a fit. So we're, you know, HR is saying, let's use AI for a better fit. The candidate is saying, let me, let me make myself look better. I mean, how is it? The only connection is that everybody wants the process to be streamlined. Yeah. I'm going to throw out there from a, a just a, literally because hot off the press yesterday for me, this is a shout out to my friend Wallace Fontenot from HR Maximizer. I sat in on a NACR webinar. It was our last one of the year. And healthcare recruitment, we might not exactly be called cutting edge. I'm just going to say globally that we might be a little bit behind the times. I can remember when QR codes were already a thing, and I can remember somebody showed up at a career fair with a CD because they thought that was cool. <laughs> I was just like, you're five years too late on that one. So we might be a little bit behind these things. Now, during this, during this webinar yesterday, I literally was like on my computer, but on my iPad over here doing chat GPT using Claude AI, using, you know, looking at Otter AI, looking at all of these capabilities. And we're in the middle of doing a massive hire for particular um, particular skill set that we're looking for, a particular position. And I took my posting, which came from a very painful intake session. It was like a lot, not painful because it was painful. It's just, you're trying to pull IT, like what's important? What do we put out there? How do we personalize this? And in, I think less than three minutes, I created a 
um, a basic job posting. I created a, a job posting with the format that we tend to use, which is like a who you are, what you'll do, what you'll bring and who we are. And then I went Lou Adler-ish and I created a job posting that was like performance-based driven job posting of the exact same thing. And I just sent it to the leaders this morning. I was like, hey, here's what I created that we talked about. And then, oh, by the way, here's what AI just did for us. And we could personalize this. And we're probably going to marry the two and blend them. You can't just go, it, it needs to be personalized. You need to speak from your heart and soul as an organization to whatever the thing is that you're using. But, and then the idea that, oh, wait, I can actually record my intake session with my manager and then use like an, a whisper or an otter AI for the recording and I can create the posting from there. And then I could use, you were talking about matching candidates, right? Like I could use, what is that called? The um, I, I wrote down, hang on. Oh, like prompt perfect. So to help you do matching of skills and looking at all of those candidates. So that to me, like my, my TA team, they're going to have fun next week because we're going to have a whole session on this. And I think it's going to make some of them really happy because they struggle with the creativity piece of it. The creativity piece for me flows right out of me. It's just, I love it. I love the recruitment marketing aspect about creating a job posting, but to take AI to create a job posting and then my creative genius or prowess, whatever we're going to call it, well, it's going to be fantastic. And it's half the time. So I'm excited. I mean, I think there's there's opportunity. The thing that you guys experience that makes me cringe. <laughs> You're muted, Christine. There we go. The development in AI and the tools themselves has increased. I happen to be part of a group that we watch the startups, right? So it's an investment group that looks at startup technology. We employed one of those at the beginning of this year, right? So we had an initiative for HireGate to have it create a candidate overview. And without AI, it was like on a six-month list. One of our developers took the new tool 24 hours later, we had it. And I mean, the impact is incredible because it, it can save us up to 11 hours per recruiter per week. And, and here's something for new recruiters, that same AI that helps you create a job posting, you can turn around and ask it, uh, give me 20 questions that I can ask about this job for an intake session. Yeah. So if you're new for your tech friend, new to healthcare, healthcare definitely has its own nuances. Every organization and every segment of, of business does. Um, but wow, that just teed up 20 questions for me to ask without <laughs> but, me having to really know a whole lot about it. No, I, but that, I think this is great that we are talking about this access we all have, but most organizations are saying, no, our employees are not allowed to use it. So, why is that? Most most enterprises at the enterprise level, you cannot use ChatGPT and things like that using your work computer. Very rarely, Microsoft, of course, but most enterprises are not allowing you to do this, or they allow with a very small group of people. Um, so this is going to come to a uh, to to the surface next year because people know how valuable it is, but the safety and security, cybersecurity, is becoming a real problem. Because anything that you feed the machine learning, all of that, uh, you know, large language models and all this, if you feed something that has personal information, not good. If you feed something that's IP for your company, not good. So it's very hard for companies to control that. They don't have that control yet. So they're saying no ChatGPT in this environment. So we need to deal with that next year. But you know what? I was <laughs> thinking in the last 30 minutes here, 30 seconds. One of the problems with recruiting for the future is that employees are more savvy. And candidates, yes, you start the candidate polling with a great experience. But then as you discard them, you ghost them, right? Most recruiters ghost candidates. They never hear from you. No, large organizations. I'm talking about large organizations. And actually, is 90% of the experience is that People are ghosted if they're not selected for interviews. And then uh, even when you get to the interviews, those who are select out sometimes never hear from, from the recruiters either. So what's happening here, there's a lot of people who already don't trust HR, but now they're beginning not to trust recruiters either. 
And that's a lack of trust that's going to end up being the reputation of your company. I think companies talk a lot about EVP and they shine on websites, but it's becoming so dichotomous what they propose in their website, career sites, and what actually happens that people are much more discerning. They've said, no, I'm not going to be part of this company because. And I think we've been trying to fix it. I think we've been trying to fix this the wrong way. So the way that we've been trying to fix this is by saying, how can I respond to these 9,000 candidates? Instead of saying, how do I make sure I don't have 9,000 candidates? candidates. Yes. Yes. That's sophisticated talent acquisition. Exactly. When you take, and I, what, what we're seeing now and what's been the most successful for us is knowing your EVP, focusing on your EVP, sourcing for your EVP, advertising to your EVP, putting those two buckets together, then adding your referrals and also adding your um, internals and looking at that, that is your candidate base, right? I, I have to, really, I have to throw- Of those four, you really just need better controls on who's applying. Right. And in order to filter out, this is what Jess was telling me yesterday, Jess and, and our director of recruitment, sorry, Jess, we're, we're saying in order to do that, well, we just need to ask simple questions, right? And that'll start to filter out some of these AI until AI catches up with that. But I think we need to get myopic and we need to, because when you look at all four of those prongs, in almost every case, when we first come in, especially when we tag team with the Lou Adler method, you'll see most of their candidates are coming from referrals. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes that's not so great, right? When you put them in with the whole mix and you look at all four categories, you make a better hire decision, better productivity, and better retention. I I have to close this out with two things. So applicant tracking systems, even the most unsophisticated ones, it's a nice way of saying something, um, even the most unsophisticated applicant tracking systems allow you to ask questions to score people, and that helps you right there. Number two, nobody thinks about this. I could probably look at 100 websites and see maybe five where you actually have a page that is kept updated that tells people about the applicant journey. Here's what happens when you apply. Hey, check your spam folder because you know what? Sometimes those emails that are automatically dispositioned or even manually sent from your ATS go to your spam. So you think you've been ghosted, but you really haven't. We've been trying to reach people to get a phone call scheduled and it disappears in their spam. So if you re- if you redirect them on the front page during your application, check this page out. Here's what's going to happen. But then you have to hold your people accountable to making that happen that curates a much more positive experience because if you tell people the why and you give them the, empower them with the knowledge of what to expect and then you deliver, then it it creates a much better experience. So, okay, Jess. (laughs) Next topic, Christine. How are we doing? Okay. Just, I I did want to make mention about, okay, don't tell me just one, one more thing I think about. AI that's important. And that is, um, if you didn't see last month, a spinoff from CBS that, so we asked AI, and this is really a segue into diversity. I asked um, ChatGPT to define diversity and did an awesome job. Then I looked at the visuals that CBS produced, right? So AI can definitely identify what bias is, but just like us, it's bias. Because when you said, Show me a good leader, it showed a young white male. Show me a bad leader, it showed an old white male. (laughs) And then show me a follower, it showed a young woman. And then there were two other subsequent of that. So when we look at AI and we we have to understand where the information is coming from, because we pilot these, especially in the sourcing arena, we pilot so much that doesn't even work. Or behind the machine, there's this ghost that's actually physically doing the work which is kind of scary, right? These tools are not inexpensive at the enterprise level. I think we're going to see them come down a bit, but not initially, especially not where they have the biggest impact because the data is the purest, right? So in finance, in um, finance and banking, like the fintechs were one of the first, and insurances, because the data is pure. The challenge that we see in the medical field is that it's fragmented. So you're, because of HIPAA, right? The nature of privacy restricts sharing of data. And the data that's put forth comes from legacy systems and those systems 
aren't necessarily accurate. So it's very, and it's a shame because it's our health, right? I mean, you want your money intact and you want your insurance intact, but what's more important than being live? So I'd like to see that change. Okay. The employee-employer power shift. And I know, I know Wagner's got a lot to say, Wagner's got a lot to say about this. Um, but I do want to, a friend of mine, Suzanne Turbin, who I've known, she's a longtime talent acquisition executive. She works on it now at this point, came from it and works on it. And she said, um, and particularly she's seeing a lot of return this year. She saw a lot of return to workforce um, performance measurements, right? So in 2020, nobody's measuring anything. In 2021, everybody's losing people. are like, don't say anything. If he's not doing a good job, we just got to keep him. And I think in 2022 and certainly in 2023, we saw these big returns into performance management. I thought that was very astute of her. I wanted to get the, the panel's take on that. Um, and then the number of students in the medical field, I, I'm, you probably know this, Teresa, but I don't think people did. I did not realize this since 2020 has increased significantly. Right. So I don't know if the pandemic incited people to say, well, maybe, you know, maybe I need to work at a bigger cause. And that's across the board, not just doctors, but across the board in the medical field. Um, and then something that I want to add in February, Kevin Haran, the chief soul, isn't that the coolest title? He's the chief soul uh, um, officer he was on the program a couple of years ago for JSX. And I think when he was on, they had like 100 employees, Jess. Now I think they're up to 500. JSX is, like, is a regional airport. I'm an original airline. Um, so they're in a very competitive, but he's going to talk about how he saw, he was able to see in real time, his employee engagement dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. He was able to identify why it was dropping and he was able to change that all this year. Right. So we look at our organizations like, oh, we're in year three of doing a study of employee engagement. And here he was able to do it very quickly. He'll be on in March. But I think that was a critical issue. And I think when we look at the how nimble some smaller organizations are, that that's allowing them. And certainly in the tech sector, tech candidates are more attractive at this point to smaller mid midsize organizations for that reason. So with that, I'm going to take my hands off. You guys are in the seat and tell me about where do you think the shift in power is going? You know, I, I have to mention one research from the Pew Research Institute. I was talking to CHROs a few months ago, and the Pew research shows that nothing changed for the last 10, 20 years. Here we are discussing the same topics that we've been discussing for 10 years. Now we add AI, but that's another thing. Because the Pew show, I saw this chart, I said, is it possible? Because we talk about performance management being the best way to keep up a high performance culture, and you weed out the people who are low performers. First of all, I'm still to see a company that has consistent methodology to weed out low performers. I haven't seen it. They lay off people instead. Nobody gets fired for performance. They are laid off. Secondly, the Pew research shows that 41% of all workforce has less than one year. 40%, less than one year tenure. 42% has more than three. And the rest is like in between. But it didn't change from the last 20 years. When you see the chart, it says, how can that be? It's exactly the same dynamics. Nothing's changing. People continue to attreat. Attrition is an average of 10, 12% in some industries, 20% in others, customer service 35. Nothing changed. Why do we try to change pretending that we are going to apply performance management process, programs, and policies to effectively change what hasn't changed for 20 years? So what I'm saying is HR has to mature because the low-value work focusing on performance management that everybody hates, focus on things that are process-oriented just for the completion and compliance, is no longer creating value. That's why HR is very close and at risk on not being at the table with the business growth strategies if we don't open the talent pools, if we don't open our mindsets to helping the business create the right teams for the right missions and irrespective of full-time employees or if it's contractors, because I think the future is blended workforce. And I think that's what we should focus on. What are the skills, what are the capabilities and how can we make teams effective? Instead of trying to pull this performance management as a 
as a solution is never going to be a solution. In fact, it's taking capacity out of the HR folks who could be doing added value. For example, org design has to change now with AI. Work design has to change because the roles don't match what people do anymore. So why don't we elevate the value of HR to focus on organizational capabilities, organizational design, work design, and the employee experience is an outcome, not a program. So I think we are just misled by what's important. I think it's because HR people and and business leaders focus on what's trending. You know, the shiny new object that you said. I think people go, telemarketplaces is a great example. I love them, but they are losing value because we don't know what skills ontology is as opposed to the taxonomy that we use for our job descriptions and job architecture. So it's becoming confusing to people to understand where to go, why, and why the recommendations don't match anything that they desire. It's not the tool, it's how we are using the tool that's very misguided. And and <laughs> let's not, you know, oh no, that's all you have to say. Let's not forget too, sometimes, or not sometimes, I see it more often than not, especially across healthcare systems, but in my space, where people tie performance to their merit and, and you get these, I, I can tell you, 2005, my first year as a nurse recruiter at a hospital, I remember we had somebody who wanted to come back and we were going to go rehire them. The first thing you do is, what do you do? At the time, it was a paper file. Let's go look in their paper file. Wow, their performance appraisals, straight fives. They were the best they could be. Five stars. Oh, fantastic. Never had been written up. You go to the hiring manager. Hey, so-and-so wants to come back. No, I'm not going to bring them back. I would not want them back on my team. Absolutely not. 100% not. Okay, hiring manager, could you please explain to me how I'm going to stand up in a court of law if I get deposed, because this person could file a lawsuit, we won't hire them back, they had straight fives on their performance appraisals. Well, I wanted to make sure that they were able to get the raise because they had a family and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> that was my foray, that was my ent- my entrance into the world of merit performance appraisals and the huge disconnect, because people want to be nice. Because even though I don't like you as a as a person who works for me, you're not a very good worker, but I know you still have bills to pay and I'm going to do everything I can to help you because I don't feel like we we as an organization do whatever X, Y, Z. So that is, that's the bane of my existence. And it's like, you know, you don't use your mid-year, if you even have a mid-year, you don't stop what you're doing for 10 days and do performance appraisals once a year. And that's when all of the all of the stuff comes out of the woodworks. If you're not meeting with your employees and purposeful, thoughtful rounding, not just walking down the hall, hey, how's it going? Hey, how you doing? Great, okay, and you keep walking. If you're not asking them, do you have the tools you need to do your job? You know, is there anybody that you wanna recognize? Is there anybody, is there something that you would like to learn that you haven't been taught yet? Like if you're not asking those questions as a leader, you're not engaging with your employees. And then when you find out that they're disengaged and they're talking to you in the, in the annual review that they're looking to change jobs or roles and you're shocked, well, it's because you never left your office for the last year. So, and you don't have, or I say your virtual office, you didn't even check in with them, even virtually. So, Teresa, the last thing I, I, I say to that, because I know we have to move on, is how about really focusing on managers to help them be at their best? I promise you that's going to have incredible results. You decrease the focus on this performance compliance to check the box on workday. You decrease the volume of those reports of engagement. They are late anyway. You ask people to tell me, how do you feel in July? And by October, I tell you how how I heard you. (laughs) And then there is no action because October is too late. We need to close the year. So next and right. I, why don't we focus on managers? I think 2024 is going to be the year of the manager. I think you, you clicked out, at least for me. What was that? You think 2024 is going to be the year for what? Of the manager. It will be. Well, I think before we get the managers involved, you know, you, one of the, the the terms you keep using is HR needs to mature, talent acquisition needs to mature. I couldn't agree more. 
but how and when and where. I think so much is, <clears throat> there's certainly <clears throat> structures, but wouldn't it be great if we could get that message through? And I think, you know, you, you hear Sherm, you see these organizations, HR has got to get to the table. I am so tired of it. It's been so many years. And I just want to give you an example too. There's a hospital system that a friend of mine works at. And she was so frustrated because she said, they came out, this was last year. They were realizing they were starved for nurses, didn't want to do any more contractors. So they offered a $25,000 referral fee for everybody who referred to nurse. The nurses went up in arms and said, where's my 25,000? If you can give me 25,000 to recommend somebody, like, is anybody paying attention that all of these things are connected? And I really think <clears throat> taking a look at and understanding my employee and my candidates are my customers. They affect my bottom line. They affect everything I'm doing. Because I think it, I think people have been siloed. Here's my finance department operates this way. This is on my P&L. It looks this way. And I think that's the first reason. So we don't understand the value of our own people. And that's what wouldn't, we wouldn't it be interesting if you took the $20,000 sign-on bonus, which there is a ton of them out. No, 2025, 10, 15, fill in the blank. 25, let's say it's $25,000 sign on bonus. And how would you be, what would you, how would you sell that to say, you know what? And put it on a job posting. We're not offering you a sign on bonus. We took the money that would have been a sign on bonus and we've incorporated it into your base pay. And now we're super competitive over everybody. I don't know. I mean, what would that look like? How would you convince finance to get on board with that? Um, it's just food for thought because- Well, I've been there, done that. You if need you to look at the data. If you collect yes. the data and you can quantify it and you can say, uh, if we're losing 40, just off the top of that, if we're losing 50 people a month and we give the money to them and based on our survey, we retain 25, we just recouped our loss. So it, it's a matter of understanding it that way. And looking at, to, to Wagner's part, looking at talent acquisition, looking at our people from a business perspective. Yeah, you want to, you want to, there are people, we want to, we all want to be human, but we also need to look at the practicalities of the business and how important people are to the business instead of it just being like what we all know and say. We need to understand financially how it equates out. And sometimes when we do cost of vacancy studies, like how much does it cost for a position to be open? Sometimes entire departments go away. Sometimes entire product lines go away. But it's always for the good and the end. Sometimes you make a decision to outsource something. It's in, it's interesting. Cost of vacancy is a good metric that can help you get there. Sorry, Jess. So our last we've got we've got like three minutes, maybe four minutes, maybe to go through diversity. Um, I'm just gonna let you know my sentiment, right? So I think that diversity has lost traction, according to. Bard, it's moved to number three. It's the top three initiatives for 2020. The top, the biggest challenges for HR in 2023, I put into AI Bard for Google. And it said talent acquisition and retention was number one. Employee experience and engagement was number two. And then number three was diversity and inclusion. I think the end of 2022, we would have seen that inverted. I think diversity was a bigger issue. I'm hearing from people that they're losing funding for their diversity initiatives. I'd like to hear what you guys have to say. And I just want to make this one statement. The census data now shows that 56% of millennials are white, mm -hmm. whereas baby boomers were 75%. Mm -hmm. Additionally, there are now more millennials than baby boomers in the U.S. population, as the 18 to 44-year-olds make up the largest age bracket in the United States. So what do you guys think? Good for business, 18 to 44, great. Okay, good for business. But the reality is, I think businesses, it's, it's so weird, isn't it, to think that to be successful in the future, business have to be less business-like because the human innovation, ingenuity to apply AI tools to different industries, like we are doing with customer services, we are doing really well with customer services, but can you imagine if you start bringing that to other customer relationships and employee relationships? I think is the is the era of ingenuity that's going to win. 
but I think companies have to let go of the idea of metrics guiding their actions. I hate to say this, but I think in some terms, D and I and B is a perfect example. They feel good because they increased one point year over year. That's not a metric for diverse workforce. The diverse workforce inclusion has to include engagement, has to include how innovative have you been, has to include like how diverse are the teams in general. And all the dimensions of diversity have to be accounted for, not just the gender and the race. And I think we are misguiding ourselves to think that we need to report. But one thing I tell you, what's going to pressure everybody else in enterprises, this is enterprise globally, the CSDR coming up in 2026 in Europe is the sustainability disclosures, includes social disclosures about the workforce dynamics. And it's not about annual reports that you can craft in a way that looks good and looks beautiful. Is disclosure. They only want numbers. And when that hits the fan, you're going to see all organizations trying to figure it out. How am I going to report the numbers accurately and explain the difference between year on year declining in diversity or vice versa? So this is going to create another GDPR. Remember GDPR? (laughs) It's another wave, but now we need to disclose numbers. Why did you lay off so many? Blacks, why did you lay off so many men? Why did you lay off so many women? Everything's going to be out in the open and transparency is going to be real. And that's I, I think um, I, I think of things in terms of a talent acquisition landscape, but also a, a, a retention landscape and what you're offering to employees with regard to diversity. So we just had a conversation this morning about education, education requirements. Now, the hospital that I work for, I'm I'm in Maryland. Now, recruiting here in Maryland in the D.C. area is like a huge melting pot of people. I absolutely love it. But are you an organization that's going to actually require a high school diploma from somebody when the high school, if they went to a high school, wherever they went in another country could have burned down 50 years ago. And now you're not going to hire them because you can't certify like that they actually graduated from a high school. Is it required for the job? Um, So things like that. I, I saw, I saw, a, a, I, I'm going to, I'm pitching this next week. Like I saw a beautiful job posting and it's, I, I'll quote it. It says, note that any education requirement listed above may be deemed satisfied if you have equivalent combination of education, training, and experience. Good. That is how we should be approaching Good. the world. The idea Good. of looking at pedigree is it, we should, we should, the people that are the scrappers, the ones that have the associate degree in nursing versus the bachelor's degree and you're hiring for a magnet hospital, well, for goodness sakes, give them the money to get their bachelor's degree once they get there. Yes. But that associate degree nurse probably worked two or three jobs sometimes to get themselves through school. I was one of them um, in 1992. I'm dating myself, but I worked three jobs to get myself through school. And I wasn't going to go for the bachelor's degree. I needed to make money sooner than later. I didn't have time to go do the four-year program. So we're, looking we're, at the- we're coming, we're coming up on time. I know, but just, I really like I, ending I this with Scrappy. <laughs> what was the other one? Uh, scrappy. You and be a scrapper. You got to be a scrapper. And you know what? It's look- Scrappy and Grit going into 2024. Look, there we go. Scrappy and Gritty. <clears throat> with that, let's go around real quick. Final words. You only have a few seconds. So go ahead, Teresa. Uh, you know what? I think that um, the other thing people need to look at with the world of inclusion is benefits for everybody. Regardless of your marital status, I think it's looking at benefits for all benefits for all and employee resource groups to help support all love. It. Bye you for one word to me is consciousness. I think we are seeing the signs of collective consciousness because AI is not artificial is collective intelligence. So I think we are in the right trajectory to understand how our own consciousness can change the world. And I think you will. Did we answer the, the did we answer the questions that were yes. put in the box? Yes. Okay. Yes, great. Yes. Jess, anything in closing from Jess? Um, I'd say just my thought for the years, get comfortable with the idea that a lot of roles in TA may change due to AI automation. But I think yeah. it's only going to empower those that really put true thought and advisory into their work. That's awesome. Any questions that we have, Jess, that we need to get to? 
Um, Bob just made a comment about the application issue we were talking about. He said, what if we had CAPTCHA for applications? Um, I haven't, I haven't seen that, but I don't know if it may cause compliance issues as well. So that's definitely something to look into. Um, and then Michael said, you know, 100% agree about performance management that Wagner pointed out. He did ask, has anyone had any experience presenting performance management in a way that managers believe in? what they are measuring their employees to. Yes, actually, I, I, I have a quick story uh, because at IBM, what we focused on was helping managers, not with the policies process or policies, was all about the moments of impact. I just needed to be a human being knowing how to handle emotionally charged moments. Focus on the moments because performance management is just a policy and a process. Great. Another, another great way to do this. And Just I did want that. to mention, we do have our first webinar, Reimagine Talent webinar coming up in the year for Wednesday, January 24th at 12 p.m. Our guests will include Clem Chang and Kent Carrig of FutureSolve. They are from an organization that provides HR advisory services and integrated technology solutions. On that webinar, we'll be discussing the future of talent and how that affects HR for 2024. So keep an eye out for that announcement through our LinkedIn social media accounts, and we'll be sure to include a link to register and an email to you shortly. Wonderful. Two, two excellent people that have recently left in the seat. Ken, I met when he was uh, CHRO at Comcast. I think he was with SunTrust before that <clears throat> and, and something subsequent to that. And then Clem, who's got a long history in HR as well, both the good predictors of future. So looking forward to seeing them. I'd like to wish all of our viewers, first off, namaste, gratitude for following, love your minds. What you have to say really resonates with us here at People Science and I think with the whole audience. Thank you for a fantastic year. Looking forward to 2024. Everybody have a safe and happy holiday. Thank you, Wagner. Happy holiday. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.